Let's go. I'm Oliver Bruce. I am the host of the Micromobility Podcast and uh, host of the Micromobility Conference when we do get to meet. Um, and today I have with us Mark Fronmeyer. How are you doing today, Mark? Oliver, I am doing very well. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me on the program. Oh, I, 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 yeah. Uh, as anybody who's listened to this podcast knows, I'm pretty frothed about you guys. It's, uh, it's, yeah, this is, this has been a conversation a long time coming. Um, and actually, uh, for, for those who do listen to the podcast, you may remember that we, we actually interviewed Mark back in November, 2019, uh, back when the share price of Akimoto was uh, about a dollar 50 or something like that. So yeah, uh, early, early days. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is a company that I've been following, uh, you know, Mark's just right in the very early stages of your journey um, to try and build this. And I thought, you know, we're going to dig into some details because I think we've got the, the, the time um, and capacity to be able to do that. And so for folks who are joining the call, um, you know, uh, please drop some questions into the into the uh, into this uh, into the the questions and answers, and, and we can go from there. Um, for folks who are joining on YouTube, uh, this is part of our micromobility webinar series. Um, come and join us at micromobility.io/slash triple M. Um, that's our, our membership. Um, and, and you will be able to join exclusive webinars like this um, going forward. Um, but yeah, we, what, what we'll do is, Mark, if, if, you, if, you, if you're good with it, we'll, um, we'll do sort of about uh, 35, 40 minutes of, of question, I'm uh, sorry, of you and I back and forth. And then uh, we'll move into questions after that. Perfect. Um, yeah, awesome. Great. So, so um, yeah, look, I mean, for the uninitiated, uh, you know, I think it's probably worth us taking uh, taking them through what is Arkimoto. I mean, I feel like most people joining this call are going to have a pretty good understanding of what it is, but maybe if we start there, Mark, and your journey there, and then we can kind of dig into, to, to, to get into some questions. Well, I've, I've got a quick video that, that gives the, uh, it's the, it's the 20 minute story distilled down to four minutes of, uh, of fun. So let me throw that up uh, on the screen yep. and then awesome. uh, we'll just dive into it from there. How's that sound? Sounds great. All right. Well, then here we go. This is uh we build rides. Arkimoto, we build rides. Light, electric, ultra efficient rides that are outrageously fun to drive. Because getting this with this is nuts. We build Arkimotos for people and for delivery and for people who help people. We're a public company because we have a public mission and we invite you to join us. I'm Mark. In 2007, I went looking for something that didn't exist. Because then and now, we drive crazy big, multi-ton extractive rigs for all the simple trips. Times everyone, we pave over half the city, gridlocked, around a world on fire. I wanted a light footprint electric vehicle. Affordable, fun, and dialed for the everyday. I couldn't find it. And thus, Arkimoto, and a new platform for mobility. Twin electric motor front wheel drive with a burly battery and a powertrain that sips electrons. We launched production of our flagship product, the Fun Utility Vehicle, in 2019. And from the response, we believe it lives up to the name. <laughs> this is really fun! Oh my god! It's Woo! Woo! Oh my god, this is so fun! Very cool. And wow, does it handle? Everybody wants it when they see it. And they haven't even driven it yet. The real joy is when you get to drive it. And then you just get the feeling of what it's all about. Hey, Mark, what's up, buddy? I uh, just want to let you know how much I am enjoying my amazing Arkimoto. It is an absolute blast. Uh, people are chasing me down in the neighborhood to see it. Let me guess, you want one. <laughs> I'm gonna buy shares. <laughs> right on. <laughs> At the onset of the pandemic, we launched the Deliverator to bring the benefits of Arkimoto's platform to last mile delivery of essential food and goods. The Deliverator's spacious storage suits a wide variety of fleet uses. Its svelte form maneuvers through traffic with ease and parks in spaces no full-size vehicle can. Saving fleet operators precious time means money that flows directly to the bottom line. And we launched the Rapid Responder to help those on the front lines achieve their missions more quickly. I think that the Arkimoto is the perfect vehicle to implement in our city. It's lighter, it's more efficient, it's quicker. Um, there's a cost savings that are associated with it in terms of sustainability, maintenance. I see this as a daily deployed apparatus. How come the cops aren't using one of these? Finally, we announced the Roadster. 
Arkimoto's premium entry into the established class of pure on-road fun machines. We sell direct. Arkimoto adopters place pre-orders and configure options on the website, and vehicles are delivered directly to our customers. The curious can enjoy the Arkimoto driving experience at our rental centers. Our rental-first model turns what is normally a costly hurdle to brand awareness into a revenue stream. Every Arkimoto is built here at our factory in Oregon, the AMP, where we transform raw material through part cutting, forming, welding, machining, and final assembly all under one roof. With the growing demand for alternative personal transportation around the world, highlighted by our thousands of FUV pre-orders, the seismic shift towards home delivery of food and goods, and over 50,000 fire stations in North America alone, we believe Arkimoto is poised for expansive growth. Meeting this demand through mass production is now our primary goal. To that end, we've entered into an agreement to purchase a new facility that will increase our manufacturing footprint more than five-fold and we've teamed with industry legends to refine our platform and product family for volume at a price that is affordable to the wide market. We aim to prove our model can scale and this venture can go global. Arkimoto is and always has been powered by a community of stakeholders with whom we share a vision of sustainable transportation, clean skies, and a future that's a whole lot more fun. We hope you'll join us. So <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool, man. You've done a, you've done a great job with that video. That, that tells the story really, really well. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I, hey, I, well, look. I, wrote the, I wrote the script for that in the, uh, in the fire, uh, when the fires were sort of at the gates last fall and it was sort of like, uh, we don't have a lot of time here, folks going to have to move quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear you. Um, I, I want, I want, um, to take the time here to kind of unpack a little bit of it. Cause I think you've got such an interesting background of how you kind of got into this with Arkimoto. And, and I know that we've kind of, you know, a little bit of your background, but if we could run over that a little bit again, and then sure. why you, um, you know, your wish to kind of go and address the market for, for electric mobility from the bottom up rather than something like Tesla, you know, like how did, how did you think, uh, you know, how did you think through that uh, when you, when you first started? I think so. So I, I was originally a software engineer, uh, entrepreneur making video games uh, and sold a company in 2007 and went looking for an electric vehicle. And I wasn't looking for a full size electric car. I wanted something that was going to be much lighter footprint, truly affordable for the mass market. Um, because I, I mean, I really on a, on a fundamental level believe that we are not going, the, the, the graphs don't line up in terms of the carbon emissions we, we reduction that we must achieve in order to stab off the worst effects of climate change. We don't get there if all we do is electrify old ideas. Um, and where, where I saw the real opportunity was in this giant gap between the bike and the car um, that, you know, at least on the road of, uh, of Eugene, Oregon and, and all over the United States, you know, you had to have two wheeled vehicles bicycles, scooters, motorcycles, and then you've got full size, 4,000 pound uh, machines that carry five to seven people hundreds of miles. Uh, the reality is that the, the way that we use cars on a regular basis is by ourselves or with just one other person with a very small amount of stuff traveling a short distance every single, you know, every single day. And so that disconnect between what we use cars for and what cars can do is what creates the, the, this massive level of inefficiency in our transportation system. And so yeah. the thought was, there's gotta be a product out there that, that does that daily transportation thing really well. That's electric, that's clean, that's light footprint, that you know, can, can decongest cities. Um, and I just couldn't find it. And that was, that was really ultimately the inspiration that started Arkimoto was saying that, that, in, that in that need there is opportunity. Um, and that's, that's the opportunity that we've been going after for more than a decade now. And I think yeah. really 
the first, you know, the first seven years of the venture were just iterating over the idea, like figuring out what does, what really is the utility need of the market? What's the right platform to serve that need? Uh, and then how do we demonstrate that in a way that, that will really catch people's attention? And it took us, took us eight, sort of eight tries to get it right. Um, yeah. Even once we had the right idea, it took, uh, it took another, uh, well, it took a, a couple of years to, to build up the, the sort of the market underpinnings for going public uh, and then building out the factory, getting through compliance, launching early low volume production. Um, and now we finally have really assembled the team to go to scale. Uh, and so it's a, it's a very exciting time now to actually begin because, you know, in, in order to actually make a meaningful difference in the solution to this problem, we got to build a lot of vehicles. And so it's really critical to have to, to figure out what does the mass production story of Arkimoto look like uh, in order to serve the market at scale with the right price product. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the um, I love Akimoto because it is so, as you say, you know, it's the thing that sits in between. And Horace, uh, you know, Horace and I have oftentimes talked about the, the, the gap in what we call heavy micromobility. That we might think of the new name, heavy micromobility, sounds a bit kind of weird. But, the, you know, that, that space that exists, as you say, between the bike and the car. And it's actually really interesting, you, as you say, the, 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 the fact that the gap, you know, like all the plans that we have, for electrification, I mean, even if that was the math that I did back in like 2014, I think. And, and, and I remember I wrote a blog post about it, which is like, even if we did this, even if Tesla scaled in, insanely, you know, to, to where it's got to now, it would make even a dent really, like relatively speaking. And where we need to be going is other areas. And Horace is actually preparing a presentation on this uh, right at the moment, um, which we're really looking forward to sharing with everyone about just you know, we need, we need something else. We need, we cannot keep doing this with the old way of thinking um, if we're serious about solving uh, for climate. So super excited. Um, the part that I love about Akimoto is you, you're so bold um, and it's such a different design. Um, and, and certainly if you, as you, you and I were talking before this about how e-bikes are really exploding, I, I'm kind of curious, you know, has, because e-bike demand has gone through the roof. We're up 140% year on year at the moment in the US, 200% um, somewhere else, elsewhere in the world, Europe and, and, and elsewhere. Um, has that translated into the demand for you in the vehicles that you're producing? Like, are, are there people searching in, there, in that area? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it, I think it's, it's, it's definitely helped be additive towards the demand interest in our Komodo, uh, what we are selling now. It's also spurred us to take uh, the, you know, because, because we really aim to fill that, that gap between the bike and the car. And we see an opportunity that is in, you know, your, the, the, certainly what you're calling heavy micromobility or the, the big, the big, small things. And then yeah. the true micromobility, um, is, is absolutely core to the Arkhamoto mission. And so we, when you think, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be very curious to read that, uh, post that horse is putting together in terms of, uh, you know, the, if, if, if all we do is electrify 4,000 pound vehicles, we don't get there. But yeah. if you have a 10 X or a 40 X, uh, or you know, reduction in, uh, or I guess a four X to 10 X reduction in, uh, materials content. So you, you'd say that for every one full size electric car, you can make, you can build four fun utility vehicles, or you can build you know, 20 of what we're calling our platform two products. And then you, you look to new business models and autonomy and things of that nature to improve the utilization efficiency of the vehicles that we build. Then you can all of a sudden see a pathway to get to where we need to go. And so that's really where, that, that's, that's why Arkimoto exists. That's, that's the, the quest that we've had for 13 years is what keeps us uh, getting up every day, uh, plugging along. Um, and what we're very excited about is that we are on the, at the same time that we are bringing our first platform to scale, we are beginning uh, you know, to, to, to lay the groundwork for our second platform, which I look at it as you know, what, the, what the FUV is to the SUV, this new platform will be to the FUV. Uh, so that next order of magnitude reduction in materials, improvement in efficiency, reduction in cost, uh, and, and that's but but with with an Arkimoto twist. So we, we want to do it in a way where we feel like we are 
really meaningfully uh, adding something that doesn't exist in the transportation landscape that fills that fills the real need, um, and and so is uh, you know sort of uh, uh, electric bike plus plus. Yeah. So okay. So you call this platform two uh, on your earnings call. Okay. What else can you reveal about it? Because I know that this is going to be obviously uh, an area of intense much. interest. Not much. <laughs> the only thing they, they, well, so, well, so we acquired a company this year called Tilting Motorworks. Yep. And we believe, we did that because we believe that they have uh, the best tilting three wheeled vehicle technology in the world, um, and based on uh, decades of, of R and D and product development done uh, by uh, by their team. And last year, we I mean I've I've known Bob Mile, who's the founder of Tilting Motorworks, uh, for many years. We were, we were mm-hmm. both sort of flying the West Coast Venture Circuit at the same time, and so you know we'd see their vehicles, he'd see ours. Um, and we, we were we were always of mind like you know, there's got to be a way for us to work together, and it was during the you know during the deep COVID times I, I reached out to him and said, hey, how would you feel about collaborating on a true micro mobility project? And he he was completely game, and so we started working together, and that was as we moved down uh, through that process, I you know, I realized. We really needed to uh, be be working under the same roof, and so that's that's what prompted the acquisition. Um, but it's if you think about bringing you know best in class tilting vehicle technology, uh, we think we're going to have some best in class battery technology and drivetrain technology to apply to it, uh, and then um, some extra secret sauce that that we have never seen in the micro mobility world to date. Um, that is designed from everything that we've learned about how people transport themselves and what their utility needs are. Um, that's that's what we're going for with that platform two line, and it's going to be. Uh, this is this is what, what the, the the point of uh, bringing it up on the uh, earnings call last week was not to say, hey, this is something you're going to see tomorrow uh, yeah. or next week, but more to say. We, we really wanted to lay out what's the what's the 10 year vision of Arkimoto and how what, what's the full suite of opportunities that we see and product opportunities that we see in the vehicle landscape um, to really make a truly meaningful difference on emissions. That's really, yeah, that's really cool. Um, in terms of the the vehicle, as you sort of mentioned, the, the sort of, um, it will be the FUV to the FUV in terms of scale. Totally. Yeah, so you're, yeah, so so it's obviously going to be smaller. You'd think, given the fact that you've acquired tilting works, in theory, it should tilt. Um, the, anything well, else that you, you might assume it'll be a tilting three wheel vehicle. That, that I think that'd be a safe uh, yeah. assumption based on what we disclosed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm incredibly bullish on tilting three wheel. I think it's a, just a whole new and, and and part of the reason that I'm excited about tilting three wheel is I think it just allows for a compact, really compact form factor. And I think three wheeled is a really interesting regulatory hack, not hack hacks, probably the, the harsh word, but uh, um, one of the things I've really admired about the Akimoto and generally about auto cycle category is just that sort of you get a kind of car light functionality in the sense of its performance, similar to a car, but it fits within the regulatory region. And I, you know, can you talk me through, you know, how you thought about that for Arkimoto and maybe a little bit, we can kind of elaborate on why that's an interesting space. And, and I think, you know, what, what, what we see in the, in the three wheel vehicle space typically is, and, and I think where Arkimoto really departs from what we've seen come before is that, that typically three wheel vehicles are either designed with a car mindset or with a motorcycle mindset. So yeah. taking the, the front end of a car and, wedging on the rear end of a motorcycle or the rear totally. end of a and car. And it's wide. And yeah, yeah. Um, and you can you can sort of see that it's like if you if you had the, let's say that you worked your way up in either one of those vehicle industries to the point where you were able to go and do a project, you bring with you, you sort of a lot of the culture of either the motorcycle world or the car world. And so mm. you end up landing in one of those still kind of tilting towards one of those two boxes. In the case of Arkimoto, I mean, I, I didn't, I was not a car guy uh, when I started the company. I didn't even have a car. I was a bicycle commuter. Um, and so I, I came at it I, much more from the, the, the game designer side, which was to say, 
when you when you're making games, you can make things be what, whatever you want them to be. And in this case, it was how do we actually solve the problem? So all of the design choices that were made as we iterated over successive generations of the platform were about solving uh, the, the, the actual problem of mobility, as opposed to saying, how can we make uh, a, a car with three wheels or how can we make a motorcycle with three wheels? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, and, and efficiency was, was really the driving reason to go three wheels in the first place. I just didn't see a way to get a four wheeled vehicle uh, to the right weight level, to hit the right efficiency level, to hit that, that low cost point that we think is gonna be really key for, uh, for, for driving affordability for the mass market for one. And then as you look at the, the long-term picture, um, where we see that first platform going is in it, the, the aut autonomy has been a part of the story all the way along. And when you've got an autonomous rideshare world, it just makes no sense to have seven passenger autonomous vehicles that are carrying one person around. I mean, yep. 80, 85% of Uber, Lyft, taxis is just one passenger. And so it, to, to me, it was you know, the road of the future, the real opportunity that we have. Is, is to rethink our cities, unpave some of our lanes, make them more productive, whether by uh, turning them into parks or densifying uh, to make cities more fun. And so there, you know, part of it is, is looking at the, the, really the existential challenge of climate change. And the other part is, let's just make our cities much better and much more fun by yeah. right transport. And I, I think the electrification and uh, shared vehicle models and autonomization of transport is the perfect drop backdrop for doing just that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the other part that if I may add in there is that, um, so as far as I understand, uh, watching that space and how it's evolved, um, we will never build a car that's sub five or 600 kgs, 1,100, 1,200 pounds, just because the safety requirements uh, and the crash testing or the crash, the crash uh, protections, all that sort of stuff, just mean that you are not going to be able to get a car that's sub that sub that kind of weight limit um, uh, globally these days. Whereas the thing that's interesting about the three wheelers is, is that the the regulatory requirements are slightly more lax, and the auto cycle category is existing in every almost every country around the world. Like we have existing regulations so you don't have to go and get these order you know you don't have to get these approved in every market that you go into it's like and i'll give the example new zealand uh because you have you have distributors down here in new zealand who i've met <laughs> and and you see this in in other areas as well you know europe has the, the quadricycle category which is the yeah. flight four-wheel vehicles uh the united states doesn't have a category like that um, and yeah. the thing I think that, that we, for, for us, it's just very important to communicate with our customers that this is a motorcycle class platform. It's a much lighter platform than a full-size car yeah. uh, and, you know, drive according, be aware of that fact. Totally. Sure. But you can drive it on a car license and most, I mean, in New Zealand, you can drive it on a car license and you, Australia, you can drive it on a car license. I assume in the U.S. is that it's, it's some, some states are different. It varies by jurisdiction, uh, yeah. but in our early markets, yeah, you just a normal driver's license. And we, as soon as you drive it, you realize, well, I, I don't need to learn how to counter steer and I don't need to learn how to lean. And I Precisely. Don't to much. Uh, so, so in terms of learning how to operate a two-wheeled motorcycle, um, it, it doesn't make sense that you should be required to do that in order to operate the Arkhamoto. Precisely. And that's, I guess, the part that I'm most excited about is that if we think about sort of the landscape of new vehicles going into a habitat, that this is one of those ones where one, you have 80% of the population probably have a driver's license versus maybe five or 10% of the population who would have a motorcycle license. And that um, in terms of insurance and, and uh, you know, uh, the, the parking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, like it just fits into the ecosystem a lot more than any other vehicle that kind of is coming down the pipe. Um, it, it's just this very interesting kind of class of vehicle um, that I think is, yeah, as I said, kind of a, feels like a regulatory hack. Um, and then it just comes down to how do you get people comfortable with us as a, as, a, as, a, as a vehicle that they can go and use? And I love your strategy of going, it's fun. Because it's like, yeah, everyone, everyone's, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, we'll just start off by enjoying ourselves first. And then we find out that actually this is pretty, uh, pretty useful. We can probably well, do a bit with this. We didn't, I mean, or the original sort of uh, 
marketing and, and, and messaging around the, the vehicle when we were developing it early on was not let's highlight the fun factor. It was, you know, this is this vehicle is aimed at saving the planet and we want to reduce emissions and so on and so forth. But when we would put people in the driver's seat over and over and over and over again, they would say, this is incredibly fun. There's something, just that visceral feeling of being in, you feel like you're in the world. You get definitely has that motorbike feel of I'm in the world. I can see what's going on around me. I can uh, smell the flowers. I can interact with people on the side of the road. And so that, that component of it with the electric drive and you've got lots of torque and it's, you have this kind of direct connection. It's like a, a you know, your the, the vehicle becomes an extension of your will to move. And totally. that, that is that feedback is what led us ultimately to name it the fun utility vehicle was was the feedback that we got from people driving it. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I guess I see it less as a less of a regulatory hack and more just that we want to, you know, and, and this this extends to just how we've designed the controls. We want there to be a, 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 a low a low barrier to entry for people to be able to try it and get the benefit of the vehicle. And that's been, that's yeah. been an important component, particularly as it's, it's related to vehicles that would require you to learn how to counter steer and lean and uh, all that stuff, which has the potential to drive a, a higher degree of efficiency. And we're definitely um, going for that with platform two. But in terms yeah. of our first, just sort of general, what I call the 80% niche of transportation, um, having a very low barrier to entry is really important. Totally. And, and, and I hear you on that for sure. Um, so I, I'm just looking at the set of questions I have. I have so many questions and I'm not entirely sure we're going to get through them all. So I'm going to, I'm going to pump us through. Cause right. there's a couple of things that I, yeah, there's a couple of things that I really want to get um, to, which is Sandy Monroe. Cause I, you know, anybody who's in this space uh, who's been interested in, in kind of uh, automotive manufacturing for any period of time is I, I think uh, probably like me been um, having like a little boy's dream of having Sandy do Munro live. And, and for the folks who don't know, Sandy is a reverse engineer. He reverse engineers cars, um, breaks them down. And then he's, he's an expert in, in design and process manufacturing. Um, and during the pandemic, uh, for whatever reason, they decided to start a YouTube channel and they broke down Teslas and things like this. And they're brilliant. He, it, you know, you can listen. You can listen and hear probably the most, some of the most advanced conversations on uh, learning about manufacturing and process manufacturing, um, kind of anywhere, and it's all for free on the internet. Um, absolutely worth checking out. Um, but you know, he, he's incredibly excited about the auto cycle category. He's really into electric and those three wheeler categories, and he talks about that. And you guys have just um, started working with them, or have been working with them for about a year. So, can you take me through? You know, how have you found that experience and what are the expectations that you have about the vehicle that will result out of that? Uh, so, so I think it's, it's the experience has been awesome, continues to be awesome. And we are very excited about uh, this, the, the, the push to mass production uh, in tandem with Monroe. I, when, you, when you talk about his videos, he did, he did uh, uh, one of the things he's got that's sort of their, uh, their IP that they don't, that they, I don't think they put out yet is, is uh, Sandy Monroe's Hearts and Minds. And it's a, a, it was about a two hour long video um, that really walks through their whole lean design process, how, you know, how Sandy came to be uh, on, on the, uh, sort, sort of take the approach that he does having worked at, at major automakers, including Ford. Um, and I watched that and it was, I was just thinking, this should be required viewing for every engineering student around the world. Um, that's. The, the, I, I, I'm waiting for them to hook up with Masterclass and do the, the Sandy Monroe Masterclass on. Yeah. I think what's less well known about them, you know, they, they are very well known because of their work with Monroe Live and, and the reports that they did on Tesla uh, for reverse engineering. They also, their main focus is on product development. Uh, and so that's been, and, and while they have worked on everything, I think quite literally from Barbie dolls to the space station, their, their sweet spot is automotive and vehicles. And so um, the, the real benefit that we've seen working with them is that they've, they've uh, you know, when you're, when, you're, when you're going someplace new, it's, it's good to have somebody with you who really understands the road ahead um, and yeah. particularly getting to scale. I mean, if, if you look at the challenge that the new vehicle makers have in getting to scale, um, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a big hill to climb. And so having... Um, the been there, done that experts on the team 
helping you know basically both drive uh, the process and then uh, bring the Arkimoto team along with them. It's it's invaluable. So um, that gives us a lot of confidence as we go forward that we're uh, gonna gonna be able to. Um, hit the targets that we've laid out uh, at, at least reasonably closely and, uh, and, and, and end up there with something that's gonna be a very robust, scalable product and manufacturing process. Because ultimately this, the step that we're on right now is essentially prototyping scale. We believe yeah. that Arkimoto products have a uh, broad global market applicability. Um, and so we need to not just get to this sort of first step of mass production scale, but we need a production model that we can then copy and paste and paste and paste and paste and paste, and paste yep. uh, all over the globe. And so um, that's really, I mean, that that is the, the bulk of the effort that's going on at Arkimoto at the same time that we are deploying early low volume production vehicles into the market, uh, both with our existing pre-order customers and with fleets that we think are gonna drive scale uh, mm -hmm. uh, of purchase down the road, and then really fleshing out um, the, the whole product family so that as we get to scale, we've got a lot of different ways that we can fit into vehicle fleets. Fantastic, yeah, because I mean, the, the um, we're, actually there's a, there's a question here that I'd like to ask and it is in relation to what, to what your work, the work that you're doing uh, with Sandy, but like technical debt. Is something that we talk about in vehicles, you know, and, and the fact that, you know, you have iterations of a vehicle, but really you're kind of oftentimes iterating on the same vehicle. And, and you know, the development time frame for a car is about seven years. And when I look at your development time frame, it was about seven years as well. I mean, you, as you say, you went through a number of iterations before you kind of got into production. Um, and, and like, you know, how much does that impact the design that you design, you know, that you have in market? And then obviously, uh, you know, when you think about Sandy and what he's trying to do, are you able to kind of are you able to do it relatively easily to kind of get rid of some of the maybe some of the design decisions that you made back in 2013 2014 um that maybe are still hangovers because you kind of got to, got yourself to that stage of the vehicle and you're just like we need to get to production makes sense let's just go with it um and think and, and i guess in some ways i'm thinking about things like motors um or you know battery packs or anything like that because I, I just see the technology evolving really quickly in that space and you know, the, the timeframes on development and, and yeah, just curious if you've got any comments in there. I would say, I would sort of think of our early development process and in, in getting into market as establishing um, the, uh, really optimizing the, the, the platform architecture. And now we're going through the process of incrementally optimizing every piece of the puzzle. So yeah. the architecture is solid, good, does what it needs to do. I mean, we've, I think we've demonstrated a lot of the, the flexibility in that platform architecture, um, but I, there, we, we definitely see room for improvement in, in little ways across the board. And that's you know, primarily driven by our effort to reduce cost once we're at scale. Um, the, the other challenge for, uh, for new entrant vehicle makers with, uh, I, would, I would say, non-conventional uh, vehicle architectures is just getting the, the, the right supply chain in place yeah. to build scale is, is sometimes not possible. So in cases where we have uh, suppliers that are, are really optimized for very limited boutique runs of vehicles, uh, because we weren't able to attract suppliers that were capable of doing uh, much higher volume at lower cost parts, now we're at the stage where it's, it's much easier to interface with those larger entities um, uh, for for a, a much larger scale production program, and yeah, that that combined. I mean, there there is certainly uh, been uh, this steady onward march of vehicle technology, um, and that's gonna that that will uh, improve. You know, over time, energy density of batteries is improving. We see those improvements will make their way into future automotive products, um, and we've we've got some some other really cool drivetrain stuff that we're looking at uh, that, that is, again, primarily in the service of cost reduction, but will offer incremental performance improvements as well. So yeah. I, I'm not sure if that's a complete answer to the question as far as technical debt. Um, I, I think one of the advantages that we do have, and this is, mm. I would say, a, um, a, a, a tiny silver lining to what was really has been a very challenging last year 
uh, in the pandemic is just that you know we've been uh, we had production shutdowns in all four quarters. Uh, we put out uh, you know 97 vehicles to customers, which was uh, if you looked at our our goals going into 2020, they were much higher than that. Um, but I think having a, a limited number of vehicles on the road um, has actually been an advantage in that uh, you know we've we have. Uh, created less of a problem for ourselves, and that lets us be much more future focused, um, yeah. as opposed to uh, we have seen some manufacturers, and this is not just in the vehicles. I mean, this is, this is bicycles, motorcycles, uh, all the way up to cars. You know, just jam a bunch of products out into the road, and then have a, a, a huge challenge uh, yeah. getting them actually uh, serviced and and up to where they need to be. And I think we yeah. Have, I had a uh, Derek Derek Dorstein, who is the C. He was the CEO of Mission Motorcycle, and now he's the uh, C CEO of uh, Damon Motorcycles, is based up in Vancouver, and they do kind of high end hyperbikes. And he he was telling me about this is where that idea came from. It's because he said, you know, in 2013, 2012, 2013, 2014, trying to hire engineers to do this stuff like there wasn't it wasn't even available in the in the the tech stack. Whereas today, it's sort of like there's heaps of engineers. The tech stack's way more developed. You can get all this stuff a lot more, you know, it's far more modular. And, and that was the kind of where he he was the one who kind of gave me the idea of technical debt and just the challenges of that. And the other part was the supply chain aspect and just how how hard that whole space has been. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, for, for us, I, I think the other piece of this is that we've now been around for, I mean, our, our uh, mission mission was one of our uh, sort of in, in, our, in our peer group when, Arkimoto got started it, along with Aptera 1.0 and Fisker 1.0 and yeah. Tesla and wow. Green Vehicles <laughs> and Toyota and 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 so but just that that I think that the even just the mere survival aspect of getting to uh, to 2021 um, it's it's it, it it has changed the way that that we relate to other companies in the field and that other people perceive us. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, so we've got about three or four minutes left. And, and so for folks who are here, I would like you to, uh, if you have any questions, and I know there will be a lot, uh, start jumping them up, uh, dropping them into the, the into the chat here. Um, but yeah, look, I, I, I wanted to just ask about the deliberate because I think, you know, um, having spent a bit of time in the, you know, my, my background was I was, used to be at Uber and obviously was around in the early, well, I was around in the early days of Uber Eats. And um, I had a chance to, to interview uh, Daniel Denka, who's the, um, for, who's the the VP of product for for Uber Eats at Micromobility World, and they're talking a lot about how micromobility is going to enable kind of a new area of um, delivery and like what it could do in terms of capability. Um, and I'm just curious how you know do you see that being a larger product than the FUV? I mean, how 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 are you seeing demand in that space? And 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 um, yeah, I, I, what, what's I that looking like? I would say the consensus internally is that the deliverator is is going to be the big market mover once we've got it into mass production uh, mm. and right price point that it's just the feedback that we've gotten from early uh, pilots, um, whether you're talking about last mile delivery of food through hire car, uh, a, a bunch of the local pilots here who've used it for just what would be considered sort of fleet type applications, um, uh, just general fleet utility. Um, have been very positive. The fact that it makes an amazing mobile billboard for whatever it is yeah. that you're doing, it just sort of, you know, it screams green and clean. Um, and it, it is, I, I've, I've delivered with it. I've delivered a, a whole deliverator full of birthday presents uh, last year that, you know, were, and it was, it's just, it's surprising how much you can put in a very small footprint vehicle that can maneuver through traffic with great ease park anywhere, uh, you know, it's, it's I, the, the, the cost of operation, what we think we're going to land in terms of upfront cost of the vehicle. Um, the, the calculus there we think is very strong. Um, yeah. What, but I, I also see a, a big opportunity on the platform uh, in terms of ride share and eventually autonomous, what I would call autonomous light ride share, which is using autonomy for a portion of it. Uh, I, I see a big opportunity there in terms of vehicle sharing with uh, the fun utility vehicle and its kind of successor products. And so I'm not sure I'm, I'm totally sold that the deliberator is gonna be the, the one true win, but I think that's the other thing. I, that's the thing I really love about the platform generally is it's, 
it's got a bunch of different variants, but they're all sharing uh, uh, the, the economy of scale and to a large degree are all the same product. Um, yeah. and, then, and then there's the Roadster, which is our kind of pure on-road fun machine. And it is unlike anything else I've ever ridden. And the feedback yeah. that has been incredibly positive. So I, I guess I see um, you know, the Deliberator and to a lesser extent, the fun utility vehicle as being kind of the big mass market movers and then some other niches that help fill in uh, the, the overall volume demand. Yeah. Um, look, one final question, which is that uh, I, I, I think about competition and, um, you know, one of the areas that, are, that one of the kind of theses that we have in the micromobility space is just how just how challenging it is for incumbent automakers to ever go down market into the space. Like, I don't think you're going to see traditional automakers come here uh, and to make vehicles. But who are, you, who are you worried about or who do you think about as potential competition that you'd, you'd think might be on the horizon um, that that, that you're, you're thinking about? I would say what I'm worried about and what started Arkimoto in the first place is that we face a pressing uh, global challenge of epic scale. Um, and that if somebody can actually do what we are doing better, faster than we can, then they deserve our full support. But I would say that I think that we are going to push to be on the forefront of micromobility and right-sized transportation uh, for the decade to come. I'm, I, I'm very confident in our roadmap uh, and where we're going. I think we're going to add um, meaningful new pieces to the transportation puzzle. Uh, and I, yeah, I, I think to me, the big competition is with old ideas that mm. must dramatically change. So to the extent that we can inspire others uh, to take up the same fight and go after it is also good. Awesome. Hey, well, Mark, thank you so much uh, for this. I love these conversations. I always come away inspired and I love what you're doing. I think, um, you know, I, th I think you've got such a smart approach to, to this big problem and uh, a a in a way that's really uh, sustainable. Well, itself sustainable and uh, that we have an opportunity to really uh, address this climate change challenge that we're up against. Um, so yeah, hey, look, th th thank you so much. Um, really appreciate it. And uh, I'm really excited to see where you guys have got to. So um, congratulations. Thank you.